computer. Okay, so now I've got the recorder turned on and uh, we'll just pretend that everything I said in the last few minutes was wonderful and insightful and engaging. All right, now it's all downhill from here, but thanks for reminding me that uh, sooner rather than later because that would have been frustrating had we not had this recording, especially since some people are going to have to rely on this recording in order to complete their participation activity. Okay, so here's our plan of action. Quick rundown again. We've got some resources, and our participation activity this week is going to be making the web page along with me and uh, seeing how we go from there. And of course, there's more stuff to do. So check those resources out and let's get into making a web page first. Before we do that, let's make sure we understand what web pages are. I'm sure everybody has a vague understanding of what a web page is. So I'll just jump over to my, uh, my favorite demo page is Apple. And of course, this is an example of a web page. And you can think of a web page as a web document. Um, just kind of like we have documents in Word, well, this is a document that's in, uh, it's on the web. And just like we use Microsoft Word to view our web, our, our documents, we can use a web browser, the application, to view a web page document. Now, the only real difference is, is where we can use Microsoft Word to both view and edit a document. We don't use our web browsers to edit web pages. We use web browsers to view web pages and we use a different program to edit the web page. Just adds a little bit of extra complexity, but it's not too bad. So we use one program to edit the web page or make the web page and then a different program to view the web page. And Obviously, we can use Brave, we can use Edge or Chrome or Opera or Firefox. Pretty much all of the browsers these days will display a web page in the same way. It wasn't the case many, many years ago. So back in the early days of making web pages, back in the late 90s, um, and I'm guilty of this too, I would tell people on the web page that this website is best viewed in Netscape Navigator or this web page is best viewed in um, uh, Internet Explorer or something like that because there were some differences in how those different web browsers would treat web page code. And so people would say, hey, make sure you're viewing this web page in this browser instead of that browser. And it was an extra challenge for a web developer to make one web page that looked decent and operated the same or close to the same in both of the popular browsers of the day. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what we're going to do here. Now, all right, this is a pretty good looking web page. There's text, there are hyperlinks, which means I can click on it and go to a different web page. And of course, there's lots of images and stuff like that. Now, on my browser, I'm going to press Control U which is true for most browsers so I can view the source code. Let me zoom in on this. And what we're looking at now is basically the HTML and JavaScript that is used for a lot of this Apple web page. Now we're not going to do any JavaScript at all, but JavaScript is an important language in web development. You can kind of imagine uh, web development as being uh, three, three key languages. Uh, like a three-legged stool. There's HTML, which is the structure of the web page. There's CSS, which is the style or look of the web page. And then there's JavaScript, which are the behaviors of the web pages, the interactions between the user and, um, uh, and the web page. And we can make a lot of good looking web pages without JavaScript, but in order to do real professional websites that have interactions and things like that, JavaScript usually becomes essential pretty quickly. So this page starts up, they've got a big chunk of blank space up here, no big deal. But it starts off with some weird looking content and this is HTML. And we're gonna do some of this in a few minutes. Not all of it, of course. Then there's some JavaScript on here, and there's a couple people in class that are probably familiar with this. And for the most part, if something happens, if something is true, then, um, then we're going to do X. Else, or else, I'm going to look and see and about doing some other thing. So that's a basic little JavaScript there. They've also got more JavaScript on an external file. JavaScript is more of a programming language. And then we get into some more HTML. Okay, you can see there's a bunch of, um, these are hyperlinks. So this is how you make a hyperlink on a web page. 
It's hard to read right now, but we'll do a much better one. I take that back. These aren't hyperlinks. These are link tags and they do, they do something else. Don't confuse link tag with hyperlink. Those are not hyperlinks. Okay, I'm just gonna scroll down. I know this doesn't really make any sense, but I wanna get to something that I can point to in the code that you'll see on the web page. And just gonna move, I'm gonna keep moving down a little bit and I'm looking, ah, perfect. I'm gonna look right around here. Now, once again, this is gonna look very confusing, but I wanna draw your attention to a few key words. I'm looking at the HTML, the web page language for Apple's homepage. And I see the word Apple, and I see the word shopping bag. And if I scroll down a little bit further, ah, here we go. I see the word Apple, Mac, iPad, iPhone. Apple, Mac, iPad, and iPhone. So I see this section of HTML. I'm going to look back over at Apple's website and look up at the top. Um, Apple, Mac, iPad and iPhone. So what I'm looking at in this section of the page is the HTML used to create the navigation menu at the top of every Apple website. So they're typing in a bunch of different things. Some of these things we're going to do today, some we won't. But Apple, Mac, iPad, iPhone, and then it's watch TV music support. Watch TV music and support. So this part of the HTML is making this part of the web page. Let me zoom out for a bit because that's pretty big and overwhelming there. So that's how it works. The HTML creates the structure or the parts of the web page. Now, of course, this looks pretty nice. They've got this white text on this dark gray, almost black background. That part's done with styling and things like that. Now, if I click on this little search button over here, that creates this little drop down effect. And that's pretty nice. JavaScript is doing that, actually JavaScript and CSS. And my phone is making sounds. So let me um, really quickly mute that. There we go. Sorry for that interruption. All right, so a bunch of different languages involved. And I just, for now, CSS is a different language. I'm hesitant to call it a coding language though. Let's, in fact, but that, let's bring that up real quick. Let's say that, I'm gonna do this in chat, but I'll say it out too. HTML is a markup language. So HTML is a markup language, which is not the same thing as a programming language. Um, a markup language, and we can kind of see it here a little bit. Let me find another good example. Um, Okay, I'll pick on this one. It's a little bit weird to look at right up here. And it's and it's it's got a bunch of line spaces in it. But there's this HTML tag called H2 and it's a headline level 2. So basically in the code we're marking up some invisible oh some here we go. I'm marking up this text right here. Racial Equity and Justice Initiative, okay? So Racial Equity and Justice Initiative has been marked up as a headline level two on the Apple webpage. And it's right up here, Racial Equity and Justice Initiative. Now on the webpage, it's really big and it's bold and it's white on a dark background. So H2, the tag is marking up this chunk of content as a headline level two. So that's the HTML in action. CSS, as um, Sam pointed out, cascading style sheet, CSS is a styling language. So I'm just putting that in chat. CSS is a styling language. The styling language takes that headline two and makes it bigger than normal and makes it white instead of black and changes the background color and maybe centers it instead of putting it all the way over to the left or all the way over to the right. So HTML creates the structure, CSS gives the style. Now this one doesn't necessarily require JavaScript. JavaScript is used certainly on the Apple website, but it's not used in this conjunction. This is a combination of HTML and CSS. Neither of those are programming languages. And knowing HTML and CSS does not make you a programmer. 
JavaScript is more of a programming language, technically called a scripting language, but it's close enough to what people would call a programming language that a programmer can be expert in JavaScript. So if you're expert in HTML and CSS, you could be a web designer, maybe you're a front-end web developer, although you should be picking up JavaScript skills as, to, as well. So that's how those two languages work together, which means we have to use both of those languages today, today together in Meshed. Um, we can make a web page with just HTML, but it's pretty boring looking. It's going to be plain black text on a white background, and that's how we're going to start. We're going to want to do CSS pretty soon, though, because it'll make our web pages look a little bit more polished and certainly look a little bit more readable and user friendly and stuff like that. And I'll just put it on here. Uh, JavaScript is a programming scripting language. Okay, so those are the three languages are the three legs of the stool for web development, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And we're going to focus our attention on the first two, HTML and CSS. Okay. So let's get to work. Now I'm going to minute, I'm going to actually, I'll, I'll get rid of that language there. Ah, good question, Sam. Java and JavaScript. So Java is a true object oriented programming language. JavaScript is an object-based scripting language. The only similarity is in that name. And uh, when JavaScript was invented in the mid-90s by Netscape, of all companies, uh, Java was really popular. And JavaScript, I think, was first called LiveScript, and they wanted to cash in on the popularity of the Java name. Uh, Java was owned by a company called Sun Microsystems, and basically, the uh, uh, Netscape licensed that Java name with Sun Microsystems. So it's, it's a little bit misleading, but Java and JavaScript are two different languages, and uh, they just share that same name. Now, all programming languages share a lot of syntax similarities, and so there are some other similarities between the two. But Java is not a short name version of JavaScript. And I'm glad you asked that because you have a quiz this week on some of these terms and concepts. And I vaguely recall that there could be a question related to Java and JavaScript on your quiz this week. So thanks for asking that, Sean or Sam. Okay, so to make our web page, we can do this simple or a little bit tougher. Now, normally, if I was making a web page, I would use a program called VS Code or Visual Studio Code. And this is a free program that you can install. And I'm definitely going to want you to use this program when you get to the homework assignment. However, I'm not going to use that today because I don't want to take the time. I don't want to assume that people already have that program installed. Instead, I want you to use a text program that you already have installed on your computer. Whether you're a Windows person or a Mac person, you already have a text editor on your computer. So what I'm gonna do is on my Windows machine, I'm gonna use Notepad. So good old fashioned Notepad, there you go. This is Notepad. Notepad is a plain text editor. And all computers have a plain text editor on there. Notepad++, you can use Notepad++, but Notepad++ is a different program. So if you already have Notepad++ installed, by all means, you can use it. Uh, it's a little bit fancier than regular Notepad. VS Code is fancier by far than any of these programs. So if you already have Notepad++ on your computer and you want to use that one, go for it. If you already have VS Code on your computer, because I know a couple of you do, by all means, you can use that one. But I'm going to go super bare bones today, and I'm going to use plain old Notepad because I know that everybody has it. Now, I'm not a Mac person. Uh, do I have any Mac folks in here? What is the default text editor? What plain text editor do you have on the Mac? So there's a program that's uh, Sticky Notes. There is a rich text editor, or R RT. I want to say it's RTF. I don't know why it's. Anyways, there's a rich text editing program on there. Okay. And then uh, they also normally have pages. 
Cool. So let's try, you can try that by all means. I, I always get a little bit concerned when I hear a rich text editor um, because I don't want there to be any conflicts. However, I bet if you use that editor and you were sure when you saved, when you save your file, if you manually type in the .html extension, I bet you're going to be okay. The reason I'm just a little bit concerned, but not completely concerned, is that a rich text editor um, might put in formatting or character encoding that's not accepted by an HTML document. An HTML document is a plain text document, which is a little bit different than a rich text document, which is what the um, RT and RTF stands for. And this is definitely different than a binary editor or document, which is what Microsoft Word is. So trying to create a web page using something like Microsoft Word would be a pain because Microsoft Word is a binary editor and when you type in characters it does so much more than just putting in a character. And that's what it's nice to use a plain text editor. And a plain text editor can also be called a code editor uh, because code editors are plain text editors. So. I'd be curious for you to give that a try, Ty, and see how that works on your Mac. And uh, the good news is, is whatever you type web page wise in one editor, you can easily copy and paste to another editor. You can save it on a Mac, open it on a Windows machine and vice versa, because a plain text code will work on any computer program as long as it's a plain text editor. So there's not gonna be any wasted effort or anything like that. If I start writing in one program, I can easily finish up and fix in another program. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna do. Now, the other thing we need to do to prepare ourselves is have a place to store our web page files. We don't wanna just mix them into our documents folder or we don't wanna mix them in with other folders and files that we might use for class. So I'm gonna minimize this, minimize this, and I'm going to, on my desktop here, I'm gonna create a new folder. And this is just gonna be my working folder, and I'm gonna call it uh, CIS 178 Participation 5 web page. Now, it doesn't matter what you call this folder because it's just going to be something that's going to be easy for you to find later on. What we put in this folder, though, is going to be important. So I've created this folder. I've called it my 178 Participation 5 web page, and currently it's empty. My web page that I'm about to create is going to go in that folder. My CSS file, my style file that I'm going to create is going to go right in that folder. And I'm gonna use a couple of images today too. Those images are all gonna go in that folder. So everything I do for my web page is gonna be all lumped together in this one folder. It's not gonna be anywhere else on my computer. So for the same reason, even though you may be a big fan of cloud storage, I'm a huge fan of Google Drive and I'm growing fonder of OneDrive as time goes on. Um, I'm not using an online cloud storage location for today. I'm using, I'm just working on my files on my local computer here. I'm gonna keep this open, but in a little bit, we're gonna come back and we're gonna see that I'm gonna to start to be building some files in there. Now I'm gonna head back over to my code editor, notepad. I'm gonna delete what I've got up there. So I've got a plain empty notepad session. First thing I'm gonna do is click File, Save As, and I'm gonna save this blank file, let's see, to my desktop, to my Participation 5 web page folder, and I'm gonna give it a file name. File name's pretty important when it comes to web pages. And I want you to use all lowercase letters and no spaces. So my web page is going to be called first webpage.html. Now I'm using a hyphen key. I know you can't see that really well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post it in chat. Okay, that's the file name that I'm using for my web page. It's first hyphen webpage.html. It's all lowercase and there are no spaces. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, Adrian and a couple other folks know web pages pretty well, so they're making them again. 
I just got lost in the sauce. Are we making a new file in that folder? Um, yeah. So basically, uh, I'm I'm opened up my editor first. In this case, I opened up Notepad and I'm doing a file save as, and I'm saving it as an HTML file into that new folder. So here's what it's going to look like after I save it, and I go to my folder. My folder now has one file in it. It's my first dash webpage.html. And that's kind of what your folder should look like too. So, and once again, I'm not checking your work as we go. If you're not doing this right now, that's okay. Um, you're gonna do it later though. And, uh, and it's, I know it's tough to keep track, especially if you've got a single display and stuff like that to jump back from what I'm doing to um, what, you're, what, what you're doing on your screen. Cool. All right, so I'm still going to keep this little folder display open just so you can see what's happening here. And you can see on my file, it's going to be pretty small. It's zero kilobytes in size. My file is zero kilobytes because my web page is blank. It's empty. Check this out real quick. If I type something on my notepad file, like Ralph, and I press control S to save, and I come back over here, and I, I don't need to refresh, but by the way, on a, a Windows uh, window, that's weird to say. You can press F5 to refresh there as well. Notice it says one kilobyte now. My file's not truly one kilobyte in size. If I were to right click on this file and I go to properties, I'm gonna see that my file, I know this is too tiny probably for you to see, but my web page file is now five bytes, five bytes. And that's because my name has five letters in it. In a plain text editor, each character makes one byte. A space makes one byte. A digit makes one byte. So that's one of the benefits of using a plain text editor. If I had typed my, my first name in a Word document and saved it, it would probably be 32,000 bytes or something like that. Just because a Word document has to keep track of the page color, the margins, the font being used, the font size, you know, the page dimensions. It has to keep track of so much extra data. Whereas in a plain text code editor, it only has to keep track of the characters that we put in there. That's why it's so easy to go from a Mac to a PC um, with a web page code. Okay, so Kevin, yours is only giving you the option for RTF. Is there an option when you save for the drop down? to choose all files or plain text? Any option like that? Uh, here, let me try it out real quick. No, it only gives me the option to name it, to put tags on it and where to save it. Okay, so that may not work then. Um, if you gave you the option for text or for all files, then what you can do then is you can choose the text format, but then you can manually name it with the .html. Sometimes, years ago, I would find it would help if I would put quotation marks, first webpage.html, if I was doing something like that. Um, it's asking me to replace my file, no big deal. So if your editor is not letting you choose a plain text format, I'm less confident that it's going to work as well for you. So what you're probably going to need to do is see on your Mac what other editor might be possible. So if I did a quick search for plain text editor, I'm sure there must be another program on there. Does Mac have a plain text editor? Uh, the program text edit. See if you have that program on your Mac. Yeah, that, I think that one was the one that I was using. Oh, okay. In theory, according to this little brief blurb, it does say it'll let you save it as plain text. Oh, I got it. Cool. Excellent.
All right. So this is the start of my web page, by the way. It's, um, it's a plain text file. The important thing is, though, it has an HTML file extension. It's not too critical, but that's what browsers are going to expect. Browsers are made to open certain files, and HTML is probably one of the most popular. And so far, my web page just has my name. I'm going to do something on my editor here. I'm going to do uh, format, font, and I'm going to make my font size just a wee bit larger here so it really stands out a little bit more. You don't have to do that on yours, though. So I've got that. I'm going to be pressing Control S to save quite a bit. And if I look at my folder again, I can see that I have one web page in there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on that web page file in my folder, and it's going to launch the web page in my browser. In my default browser, for me, that's the Brave browser. For you, it could be Chrome or Firefox or Edge or something else. So I'm going to double click on that web page file, and my web page is now opened up in my browser. And the only thing that shows up is my name. However, if you can get to that level, you have just made your first web page. Okay. I've just typed some new content onto my text editor, onto my web page code. I've got my full name up there. I've got the name of our class, and I've got the date. And I put these on three separate lines. Well, Sam, by the time our class is done today, you're going to have a much clearer understanding of how HTML and CSS are related. And so far, I haven't even done any HTML. The only thing I've done so far is put some text onto a web page file, a web document. There's a few people, you know, the few people in class that have a little bit of HTML under their belt, they're probably already thinking, hey, this is not a good web page to start with. But um, they can work ahead of me, certainly. And don't forget, your web page you make today doesn't have to match mine exactly. I'm going to do some things that are probably not 100% the professional way to go, but I'm going to try to go super easy. And then the assignment is going to be a little bit more complicated, a little bit more true. And if you really want more complicated web page stuff, then you'll take another class. Our goal here is just to kind of get familiar with this stuff, not to be experts in it. Okay. Now, what I wanted to show you by putting in this text, so I've got my name, and then on another line, I've got the, our class. And then on another line, I've got today's date. I'm going to press Control S to save. I'm going to have to do that a lot today. Control S to save. And now I'm going to go back to my web browser. And I'm going to hit the refresh button. And look how that new content is displayed up there. <clears throat> I've got my name. I've got the name of the class. And I've got the date. The key thing that I wanted to show you here is that it is on my code. My text is on three separate lines. But on the web page, it's all on one line going straight across. And that's because web browsers don't understand line breaks. So if I press my enter key on my code, the web browser doesn't know what that means. So it just assumes I'm making one big line. Now, if I want to force these lines onto three separate lines, there's a couple ways I can do it. But one of the simplest ways is to use an HTML tag. An HTML tag is like a word in the English language or any language. A tag gives meaning. So, for instance, after my name, I can type in the break tag. After the class title, I can type in the break tag. So basically, a tag has a syntax to it, a style of writing. It's an angle bracket, the name of the tag, and then a closing angle bracket. You notice I'm using the word angle brackets instead of less than or greater than signs, just because these have a different meaning with uh, coding or HTML.
So the break tag is going to break to a new line. This is a way a web browser is going to understand that I want multiple lines. Breaking to a new line. Breaking to a new line. So I'm going to save again. Now, by the way, another way I know how to save, you're, it's going to be tough to see this, but on the file name on my notepad editor, there's a little asterisk in front of the file name. That lets me know that I've made a change to my editor, but I need to save it. So I'm going to press Control S to save. Little asterisk goes away. And I'm going to head over to my browser and I'm going to refresh. And look at that. Now that text is on three separate lines. And by the way, my web browser is displaying larger because I'm zoomed in. In fact, I'm going to zoom in some more. I'm going to zoom in 200%. So things are looking bigger on my browser. I've got a big font size on my code right here. So what I do on the web page will impact, or I'm sorry, what I do on the HTML code is going to impact what appears on that web page. So far, so good. I'm using Notepad to edit my web page, and I'm using the web browser to display the web page. I've got one web page file, and that is stored inside of my working folder. My web page file has a file name that's all lowercase with no spaces and has a dot HTML extension. Hmm. So Ashley is mentioning this will happen sometimes. If you type in a tag and it shows up, okay? Let me show you what this could possibly be. Don't do what I'm about to do though. Let's see, open with, choose another program, more apps. Yeah, let's, that's going further than I want to do. Let me do it this way. There we go. <laughs> it, took, it took me a bit to get there, but I've seen this happen before. So it's a relatively common uh, beginner mistake, and the good news is it's super easy to fix. So if you're seeing your tags show up on your web page, and I'm not 100% sure this is the problem, but this is the most likely problem. What I think is happening is your code editor is saving as a text file and not as an HTML file. So in order to duplicate this problem, I went to File, Save As, and I typed in a TXT extension on my uh, web page file. And that's not the way to go. So even though it says Save As Type Text Document, I want to make sure when I save my file that first time or the second time, I'm going to manually type in the .html extension. It's important that your web page have a .html extension. I'm going to hit save. I'll replace my existing file. And so now in my folder, I've got two files, .html and .txt. Now, hopefully you can see your extensions. If you can't, you need to change your Windows settings so that you can see the file extensions because that's an important piece of information. And I think Windows might try to hide that important piece of information from people because it doesn't trust you to handle that power, you know? So I want you to be able to see your extensions. If you can't see your extensions in Windows, I believe you can go to View. This is in my little uh, folder dialog box here. I can go to View and then make sure File Name Extensions is checked, okay? If it's unchecked, you're not gonna see your extensions and it's gonna be tougher to keep track of what kind of files are which. So view and make sure file name extensions are checked. Okay, so we go to plan B. If that wasn't the issue, let me do this. I'm going to delete my text file. 
and I still have my HTML. So if you're still seeing the tag, let's, let me go back here. Here's the other thing that it could be. Is there a space? Something like that. When you type a tag, it needs to be no spaces in there. So it's an angle bracket, then the letters BR, and then the angle bracket without any spaces. No spaces. All right, you're putting me through the test here. So it's not a text file. You've got no spaces. Now, are your three lines of text, are they showing up as one line or are they showing up as multiple lines? All right, that still makes me think it's a text file. Yeah, so yours were already showing up in three lines. And, and are you using the notepad editor or using something else, Ashley? Text edit on the Mac. Well, I think all of this should work. Ooh, I might have you do this other little test here. And yeah, you may need to follow up um, with our recording. Whatever it is, I'm sure the mistake. So as we type in new stuff, in fact, in a little bit, I'm going to be deleting this and typing some new things in. So maybe that'll be an opportunity to fix it. Um, okay, Kevin, so you're also on text edit. Try this for me on your text edit editor. When you do file save as, take your file name in quotes. First, what did I call this? First web page dot HTML. Put that file name in quotes. And under save as type, if text is a choice, text is fine. But put quotation marks around the file name when you save it and hit save. Give that a shot. I'm going to go ahead and move ahead here a little bit and try some different HTML. Okay, so this is the start of some HTML, but I want to do a little bit more with this web page. Instead, what I'm going to do is above my name, I'm going to type an HTML tag. Right after that HTML tag, I'm going to type a head tag. After the head tag, I'm going to type in a title. With some content. After that, I'm going to type a closing head tag. Then an opening body tag. And then way down here, after all of my text that I did earlier, I'm going to type a closing body tag, and a closing HTML tag. It's a lot of typing. I wish I could tell you that was it, but there's going to be a lot of typing today. So at the very top of my document, I have an HTML tag. All lowercase, although uppercase is technically okay. It's all lowercase, and of course, it's got the telltale little angle brackets for an HTML tag. This indicates the start of my web page document, the start of my HTML document. After that, I've got an opening head tag. That's the start of the head section of my document. Then I've got a title tag. I'm going to let you guess what that one's doing. I've got some text. And then lo and behold, I've got our first closing tag. That's a closing title tag. A closing title tag has a slash in it. An opening tag, no slash. The closing tag is telling the browser to stop doing something. The opening tag tells the browser to start doing something. 
start creating a title and then stop creating a title. After that is my closing head tag because I want to stop making the head section. I started at one point and then I'm going to stop at a different point. When you're typing these tags, spelling is pretty critical. After the closing head tag, I start making the body of the page. The body of the page is the visible portion of the web page. Everything that we saw on the Apple website was in the body of the page. There's often important stuff in the head section, but it's not usually things that you can see on the web page. If you can see it on the web page, the body is involved. Now in the body of my page, I still have my three lines of text. After my three lines of text, I've got a closing body, which is stopping the body section. And then I've got a closing HTML, which is stopping the web page document. I started the web page document at the very top, and then I stop the web page document at the very bottom. And there's going to be nothing after that closing HTML tag. Our web page is split up into two key parts, the head section and the body section. Now I indented here using my tab key. I only did that just to make it easier to read. I could do the same thing here with these lines of text and it's going to have no impact on my web page. Control S to save browser refresh and it looks just the way it did before. And let's see, so Ashley and Kevin, um, I'm also curious on your uh, text editor do you see the file name on your uh, editor? Does it show it up there and does it look correct? Is it all lowercase? Does it have that .html extension? Okay. I guess uh, you guys are all going to have to chip in and get me a Mac. So uh, that way I can uh, practice all this stuff. Interesting. So Ashley switched over to her PC and it's working on there. Oh, virtual machine. Oh, Adrian's asking about that. Um, oh, that's cool. I'm glad it's working there. Kevin, I know there's a fix for this Mac because lots of web developers use Macs. <laughs> and, uh, and certainly, I, I, I know I've had students use TechEdit before. However, maybe this version is a little off or something or it's just doing something that I'm not familiar with. But I know there's a way. Yeah, if I just had a Mac OS and then maybe doing a virtual machine and stuff like that, then that would prevent you guys from buying me a Mac. So, Okay. Well, Kevin, even though you're not going to get the glorious feedback of our web page once we style it here, um, I still feel confident you're typing this right. And... What you could do is you could also, this would only take a couple minutes if you wanted to try it right now, is you could go get Visual Studio Code. Um, if you did a search for that, you could download it and install it. And there's a Visual Studio Code version for the Mac, and that's a more professional web developing uh, tool. And, um, and that definitely works. Um, in fact, I've got, I don't know if I have any web, Mac students in web dev right now, but certainly last term I did. All right, so here's the start of our web page. Now I want to enhance this web page a little bit. Before my name, I'm going to type H1. 
an H1 tag, I mean. So that's a headline level one. Basically, I want to tell the web browser to start making a heading, a level one heading for this web page. And then after the date, actually, I'm going to do it this way. After my name, I'll do a closing headline one. I'm going to get rid of that break tag. After the closing headline one, I'm going to make a headline two. And then after the date, I'll have a closing headline two. I'll put some line spaces on here. So my name is now surrounded by an opening and closing headline one tag. I say headline a lot, but I think the official name is probably heading. So I've got a heading one tag that's going to be my name. And then I've got a heading two tag, which is going to be the name of our class and the date. So I haven't made a lot of changes here, but I'm using a markup language. I have marked up my name to be a headline level one. I have marked up this other text to be a headline level two. Control S to save on my code editor. Go to my browser and refresh, and I can start to see that some changes are taking place. Oops, hold on, I just lost my browser. Let's bring it back, there it is. I just wanted to lock it over there on that far side. Okay, so now I wanted to make it so my web page is visible there. Okay. So there's heading one, there's heading two. How many headings are there? I know there's a couple people that know the answer. How many heading levels are there? You're close, Adrian. Perfect, Abby, you got it. Yeah, so six levels of headings. And that I'm pretty certain is a quiz question this week. So six levels of headings. H1 is the biggest and the boldest. H2 is next in size. H3 is smaller, H4 is smaller, 5 smaller, 6 smaller. There's no H7. Now, it's a little bit misleading. I used H1 and then I used H2. And that might make you think that the next heading that I used would be an H3. But that's not the way to think about it. Don't think of headlines being used as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in order all the time. Instead, I'm using H1 to be my web page title. I'm using H2 to be a subtitle or a section within this web page. If I had another section in this page, I'd probably use H2 again. If I had a third section in this web page, I might use H2 again. Um, so a web page is always going to have an H1, a heading one, and it's usually going to have one or more heading twos. It may, if I was going to break up a heading two, I might have a heading three section in there. Web pages hardly ever use four, five, and six. So, so far, I'm pretty happy with how my web page is looking. I've got my name on there. I've got the uh, title of our class and the date. I'm going to zoom out just a bit. So, on the left is my web page in the browser, and on the right is my code. I want to start doing some style changes to this web page. Now, the way I'm going to do the styling, let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to turn off word wrapping. Now, the way I'm going to do my styling is going to be in the head section. I planned on doing an external CSS file at first, but I think I'm going to do internal styles today. It's just going to simplify our practice. 
So in between the opening and closing head section, I'm after the title, before the closing head tag, I'm gonna write an opening style tag, then I'm gonna press my enter key several times, and I'm gonna do a closing style tag. So I'm going to embed style language into my HTML web page. Uh, hold on, I'm a little confused here. Where did the, uh, you had the uh, five tag slash title. Where did that end up going? Because I I put that in last and my my web page wasn't even loading until I put that in. Ah, got it. So my title is still here. The title, CIS 178 Participation 5, is just after the opening head tag. Now, are you asking where is it showing up on my web browser? Because that's uh, no, I was, I, was, I, was, I was just asking where the tag went because I didn't see it and I didn't put that tag in. And until mm. I put that tag in, it wasn't even loading for me. So yeah. I didn't want to break it. <laughs> now, I'm glad you brought this up, actually, because I kind of skipped over something that I do want to share with you. Is I wrote the title for this web page right up here in the head section, but I can't see it on my web page. There's a couple reasons for that, but one of the key reasons that I did tell you about is that things that are in the body of the page are what people see on the web page. If it's not in the body, you're not going to see it. My title is in the head section of the page. However, it's still pretty important. The title for my web page is showing up in the tab of my web browser. You can't see it because it's scrunched up so small, but it's there. If I were to bookmark this web page, the title would be used. If my web page was going to show up on a Google search engine, the title would get displayed as the, as the title of the web page. So the title is pretty important, but you don't see it in the body of the page because it's not part of the body of my code. So all of this is in the head section. The head section of my page contains the title, and it contains a set of style tags. In the style, just type this for me if you would, please. Okay, this is a little weird to look at. Now this is after my opening style tag. Now I press my indent, my tab key quite a few times here. Not important, I just did that hoping it'll make it easier for you to see on screen what I'm typing. So after my opening style tag, I typed in the word body, then a space, and then an opening curly brace. Many of you have probably never even used the curly brace key before, so. Today's your lucky day. On a separate line, I typed in the word background color. Notice it's all lowercase, no space. It's background hyphen color. Then I type a colon, space, pink, semicolon, And then on the next line, I type in the word color, colon, space, hashtag, 006, that's James Bond's predecessor, semicolon, and then on another line, I did a closing curly brace.
So this is called a CSS rule. And basically, it's a little chunk of CSS style language, which is going to tell my web browser that I want a pink background color on the web page, and I want my font color to be medium dark blue. I'm sorry, you said the font color is supposed to change as well? Yeah, it may not be super noticeable, but make sure your syntax is proper. It has to have a little hashtag sign, and then it's going to be 006. Yeah, my font color is still black, and I have it exactly the way you have it there. Ah, is your background color showing up as pink? Yeah. Ooh, cool. Um, do you have a semicolon after the word pink? Yeah, I have a space after it, so I'm getting rid of that there. Yeah, the space probably wouldn't hurt if I had a space there. Yeah, no, that's, that didn't do it. Okay, let me do a control S to save and make sure mine works. It worked. It's a little hard to tell, so let's try this. Instead of that 006, try um, 0 B0. That's going to be a really uh, bright green. No, I, I found it. I put O's instead of zeros. Ah, cool. Yeah. Because I, I'm smart. Well, I tricked people. I said 007. Try to make a joke. And uh, so that probably influenced you. Control S to save. And then I refresh. And now I've got, ooh, green on pink. Doesn't look so hot. I'm going to darken that up a bit. So I'm going to change this to 060, which is going to be a dark green. All right, I like that combo. OK, so you just have all these colors memorized. I've got them all memorized. There are 16.7 million of them, and I know them all. Actually, I know the trick. Perfect, Josh, you've got it. So Josh knows that I'm using RGB color values now. And so there's a little trick to the a little method to the madness, right? Now I'm using a shorthand version of what's called hexadecimal code. And the real version is six characters. I'm using a three character version here. The first character is red, the middle character is green, and the third character is blue, RGB, red, green, and blue. That's also a quiz question you have coming up this week. What are the three primary colors for our uh, web pages? Red, green, and blue. So by saying zero for red, that means I have absolutely no red. By saying zero for blue, I have no blue. The only thing I've got is green. Now, if I did F, which is the highest end of the hexadecimal scale, it goes zero through nine, A through F, that would be bright green. Oops, wrong button. There we go, the bright, that's the brightest green they can do. Now, if I start to go downward, if I go into lower letters, closer to A, it's gonna get darker. So if I did zero A zero, it's gonna be darker than zero F. And so my green gets darker. And if I go even lower, I get into the numbers, nine, eight, seven, six, if I go all the way down to like 030, the green is going to be super dark. It's going to look almost black. You may not even notice it. So I can just tell a little bit on my browser. It's not quite black. It's a very darkish green, almost black. And of course, if I went even lower to 010, that would be the darkest green possible. It would look pretty much black, I'm sure, to us. Yeah. I. I if I did black, in fact, black, by the way, is zero, zero, zero. If I refresh this, I probably won't even notice a change on my browser. Yeah, it didn't stand out to me. I don't have eyes that sharp. So, so that's the little trick to the colors. Now, I don't know what the code is to pink, so that's why I wrote pink in. <laughs> there is a code that represents pink. I just don't have that one memorized. However, I can tell you this. Um, you can mix colors. So if I had 909, that's equal portions of red and blue, which makes purple. There you go. 
And of course, if I'm near the F end of the scale, it would be bright purple. If I'm near the zero end of the scale, it would be really dark purple. I'm somewhere in the middle, so it's medium purple. That's how that works. I'll darken this up a little bit with like seven, seven, but you don't have to match up all the numbers, by the way. I could do 708. That would be purple, but with just a hint of extra blue to it because my blue value is higher than the uh, seven. I'll do a little more dramatic. 70A, there we go. So it's purple, but it's got a little more touch of blue to it. Okay, so that's called a hexadecimal code, and hexadecimal codes are used to give us color. Another quiz question. All right, so I'm using CSS to style this web page. I'm using HTML to give structure and content to the web page. That's how these two languages work together. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to style my headlines different. So after my closing curly braces, I'm going to create another style rule. It's going to be for my headline one yeah, just that one. H1 space opening curly brace. And then I'm going to say I want text align to be center. And text transform uppercase. There we go. So if you would take a moment to type this. I'm still inside of the style section, which is within the head section of my web page. I'm telling the browser that I want to start to style my heading one. What specifically do I want to do? Well, I want to center it. And I also want to convert it to uppercase letters. While you're typing that, I'm going to type something else. For heading two, Okay. So I'm going to leave these on the screen for a little bit. And obviously, if you're going from this from recording things later on, pause, see what I'm typing and type it exactly the same. Now, even though you don't have to, I would certainly encourage you to start experiment. Whenever you see me type something, type it the same way and then test it out to see if it works. And if it works, great. However, be curious. What happens if you changed this 2px to some other number? What's going to happen? What happens if you change the color black to some other color? And you can use the name of a color or you can use the hex code for a color. There's also other words you can use here besides solid. I'm not going to use any of those other words, but there's probably about six different things you can use instead of the word solid. That W3 Schools resource in your weekly folder, if you hunt around on there, you might be able to find it. Of course, you could also do a quick Google search and you'd find it in probably two seconds. Now I have text align center. Maybe you'll try text align right. Text transform uppercase. What if I did lowercase? So when you see something work, always be curious to know what else you could do that's different. Instead of pink for my background color, I'll change it to uh, sandy brown. OK. 
Krishna. Cool. All right. Has anybody typed in the name of a color other than sandy brown or pink that's worked? Besides black? Ooh, coral. Coral. Oops, I lost my semicolon. Oh, that's pleasant. Ah, so Sam, hope you can see that in chat. Sam uses an RGB syntax, which is a pretty good way to go too. So instead of using hex code, you can use RGB values. I'll give you an example here. Um, let's see. So the color of my text is gonna be that purple shade, but I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do border top, 20 pixels, solid, and then RGB parentheses, and he chose 110, 150, 175. Okay, so this is another way to write colors. RGB stands for red, green, and blue. And then there's a set of parentheses. And within those parentheses, there are three arguments. The first number is the red, the middle number is the green, the third number is the blue. The numbers range from zero to 255. So 255, 255, 255 would be the same as FFF. 000, zero, zero would be the same as zero, zero, zero if we were doing hex codes. And so this is another way people can write colors and it's not, it's certainly different, but it doesn't give you more access to colors. However, people that maybe do more Photoshop-y stuff, they might have a stronger understanding of this, seeing this syntax, so they feel more comfortable using that syntax. Control S to save, browser refresh. <clears throat> and now I've got that, <clears throat> excuse me. Now I've got that border up there. So that's a shade of gray, it looks like. Now we probably could have guessed that it was gonna be close to a shade of gray because all three of these numbers are pretty close to each other. And if you do equal numbers, it's gray. And since these are between zero, which is black, and 255, which is white, we could tell it's gonna be a medium gray. Now the numbers for green and blue are a little bit higher than red, so it's not exactly gray, but it's a gray with a little bit of greenish blue tint, or purplish tint in a way. Or not, no, I'm sorry, not purple, because purple would be red and blue. Um, so. so that's how we can kind of start to guess at what things might be. Now, we're plugging along pretty well, but I still want to do more content on this web page. I want to create some information here. So I'm going to go down to the HT, I'm sorry, down to the body section of my page. I'm going to press my enter key a few times after my headline two. So I'm going to work after my heading two and before my closing body tag. I'm still inside of the web page. And I'm going to create another area here. Let's see. Paragraph. Okay. In the HTML, oh, I keep saying in the HTML because I was thinking I was going to have a separate CSS file. Down here in the body section of the page, go ahead and create a paragraph. Notice I'm using a set of P tags, paragraph tags, to start making a paragraph and then stop making a paragraph.
So Ty is gray, Kevin is using white. You guys gotta start coming up with some wackier color names. Ooh, turquoise. <laughs> Golden Retriever. I'm going to try turquoise. That sounds pretty cool. My house is turquoise. How do you spell turquoise? <laughs> All right, there we go. Let's try that. Control S to save, refresh. Ooh, that does look good. It looks good with the purple text, too. I'm going to endarkify, endarkify my purple. So if I want to make this purple darker, I'm going to reduce some of these values. Instead of seven, I'll do a five. Instead of A, I'm going to do eight. That should make it darker. There we go. Increase the font size of the paragraph, doing font size 20 pixels. Yeah, Sam's got it. Um, so, yeah, font size colon space and then some measurement there. He's got 20 pixels. And then obviously you can play with that number up and down to change that font size. Good thinking. Yeah, I think I'll do that too. I'll do that with my heading two. Font size, 20 pixels. I'm gonna test that out. And if it's too big, I'll make it smaller. If it's too small, I'll make it bigger. So basically I'm just adding this to the styling for my headline two rule, my heading two rule. Notice it's still before the closing curly brace on that. So I'm putting font size of 20 pixels. This is gonna affect my heading two. Control S to save, browser refresh, and it did go a little bit smaller. If I was really curious, I could try something really small like 6px, and it's super tiny. Or I could make it 60 pixels, Control S to save, browser refresh, and it's silly big. So 20 pixels is actually pretty darn, darn nice. So I'm gonna go back to 20. Now this font size, 20 pixels, I'm putting that in my heading two, but it could have gone in my heading one. And if I wanted to style my paragraph, I would create another rule for my paragraph. Now I'm gonna get back down here. You can see already that the paragraph that I typed in the body of my page is showing up on my web page. And then I've got this other weird chunk of HTML. I've got, that's angle bracket, UL, angle bracket. UL stands for unordered list. And basically it's how you make a bulleted list on your web page. You probably weren't aware, but I typically have a bulleted list on the weekly folder in Blackboard and I use an unordered list to create that. So I use the HTML to create that list right in there. Now, after my opening unordered list tag, I've got a list item tag. So it's angle bracket, li angle bracket, and then I just typed in some text. And then I have a closing list item tag. So an unordered list is going to be made up of one or more list items. I've got one list item right now, but I'm going to do several more. Let's see, who invented the web again? You got it, Adrian. Timmy B. What country was he working in when he invented this? What country was he working in? Not which country is he from? Tim Berners-Lee is an English citizen. He is, I think he's been knighted. Perfect, Adrian, Adrian's got it, yeah. TBL was working in Switzerland. TBL 
is British. What was the name of the first web browser which Tim Berners-Lee had to invent in order to create the HTML language? The name of the first web browser. If I told you this in class, I probably mentioned it once. I think I may have mentioned it in class like two or three weeks ago. Not quite Netscape Navigator, Ty. That was invented by Mark Andreessen. Yeah, Sam's got it. It was it was called the, it was actually called World Wide Web. Yeah, World Wide Web was the first browser. And of course, now we know a web browser is just a program that is designed to display web pages. What does HTML stand for? I haven't told you this yet, although I've used, I think, most of the letters. Perfect. I'm coming up with some of these little facts and figures and stuff like that because I'm thinking about the quiz and uh, I want to make sure I hit as many quiz questions as possible. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Very, very cool. Now, Tim Berners-Lee didn't invent CSS though. CSS language came along later, a few years later. I'm not sure who invented CSS. It may have just been a collective, so I'm, I don't know that one. But, but for the web, definitely. Tim Berners-Lee, British citizen, working at CERN, C-E-R-N, and um, in Switzerland, invented web documents, the, H, the first HTML language, and of course, the first web browser. Do one more list item on here. Hmm. Ooh, versions of language. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not going to ask you about his age though. <laughs> um, HTML has gone through different versions. Okay, just kind of like the English language has gone through various versions. Sometimes we add words to the English language. Sometimes we take words away from the English language. Well, the same thing with HTML. And tags are kind of like words. So HTML has gone through various versions, kind of like software versions. Anybody know which number we're at? HTML, what language or which version of HTML are we using? I haven't mentioned that yet today. But Sam knows it from other classes, I'm sure. Sam, yep. Um, so we've got all the SAMs in class know it. HTML5. I think technically it's like 5.2 or 5.3, but we just call it HTML5. So HTML5 is the current version. Which should indicate that there was an HTML4. There was. There was an HTML4. Um, I used a four, there was a 4.2, which was really popular, um, came out like in the late 90s, like 98 or something like that. And that language, that version held on for a long time before five took over in 2013. Sam says, that sounds about right. Actually, I feel like five was earlier than that. But now 13, yeah, yeah, maybe it was 2013. And of course, before five or before four, there was a three. Ah, when you first heard about it, yeah. Yeah, sure, um, there should be a version six. And of course they do build up. And like I said, I you know technically, let me maximize my browser here. Do I still have my, uh, oh, it's probably under web development. Now let me just do a quick search. Oh, 
no, oh, there it is, HTML standard. Um, yeah, I can't remember where we're at. I think we're still like at 5.2, 5.3. Thought I'd be able to quickly look it up. But no big deal. But yeah, I would imagine there would be an HTML6, and um, it'll probably introduce even new feature, you know, newer features and things like that. <laughs> yeah. So HTML5 is the current version. Now, in addition to putting this content on here, I want us to be able to make hyperlinks because that's what the hypertext in HTML is all about, is being able to hyperlink from one piece of text over to a completely new web page. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna change the letters HTML into a hyperlink. So if somebody were to click on the HTML words on my web page, which I can't see yet. Let's refresh. There we go. So if somebody were to click on the HTML letters on my web page, it's going to take them someplace. I'm going to have them take them to W3 Schools, one of your resources. Now to convert text into a hyperlink, it's pretty easy. In front of the text, I'm going to put an anchor tag. After the text, I'm going to put a closing anchor tag. So notice I've got an opening anchor tag in front of the letters HTML and a closing anchor tag after the text HTML. I'm not done yet though. So there's a tag we use to create a hyperlink and it's called anchor, go figure. Now we have to do something new right now, and we have to put in what's called an attribute. So an attribute modifies an HTML tag. So my insertion point, you got it, you got it, Sam. My insertion point is right after the letter A in my opening tag, but it's before the angle bracket. Right after the letter A, I'm going to type space, H-R-E-F, equals quotation, and then I'm going to do a quick copy paste here because I don't know. Copy, paste, closing quote. Okay, so let's see if I can size this so everyone can see it well. Here we go. So this is what I've written. So it's angle bracket and then that letter A for the anchor tag and then space href and that's for the hyper reference attribute equals quotation and then I've got a web address. If you wanted to go something shorter, you could just type in coCC.edu or whatever. However, use the full web address. Put the HTTPS on there. Ooh, good question, Josh. To open up a new tab, you're going to write this. After the quotation mark, do that. Okay, so basically when somebody clicks on the words HTML, now here's the important part of course, my words or my letters HTML are between the opening and closing HTML tag. 
whatever's between the opening and closing H, uh, anchor tag, I said HTML tag, I think, whatever's be between those anchor tags is gonna be a hyperlink. Now, when somebody clicks on those letters, they're gonna be taken to whatever web address is in the hyper reference attribute. So they're gonna be taken, for me, for my example, they're gonna to go to the W3 Schools HTML tutorial. And I just copied that web address from the website. Now, based on Josh's suggestion, when somebody clicks on this hyperlink, it's gonna open up a new tab in my browser. And I'm doing that with a target attribute. So I'm using two different attributes in my anchor tag. The target attribute has several values, um, technically unlimited values, but in reality, just about four values. And one of them is underscore blank. Underscore blank. And that's gonna open up a new tab in my browser. Now I'm gonna test this out. I'll come back to this though. So if you still need to pause your screen when you're looking at the recording, you can. I'm gonna control S to save. I'm gonna head back to my browser. And let me size my browser a little. Oops, don't wanna do that. Let me size my browser a little bit better so you can see my tabs. I'm gonna refresh. Okay, now you can see on my browser, here's my web page, and my letters HTML are now underlined. That's a sign that they've been converted into a hyperlink. Okay, you can also see on my browser tabs, I've got one, two, three, four, I've got five tabs open. The far right tab is my web page that I'm looking at right now. If I click on my new hyperlink, it's going to open up a sixth tab and go to that web page. And then, of course, I can just jump back to my web page. So there's the new one, and here's my web page. So that's how we make that hyperlink all with that anchor tag. All right, good segue, Sam. We are definitely gonna do an image. That's part of the plan today, and that's probably where we're gonna finish off. I wanna make sure we know how to get an image into this web page, and even better, I wanna make, I wanna make that image into a hyperlink. So maybe we'll do two images, one regular image and one is a hyperlink. So let's try this. Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna come right down here. In fact, I'm kind of worried now because in the recording, I think I've got this camera thing right there. I'm not sure if I can get rid of that. We'll find out soon enough. So let's make sure I name these really well. In fact, sorry about the little switcheroo there. I'm putting my code over on the left. To make sure everyone can see this well. After my unordered list, I'm gonna create another H2. Yeah, Sam, I think, yeah, you can see it now. I'm just worried because I think when I do a recording for this, I think it fixes the um, uh, student visuals over here on the right. And so in the recording, that's where I was kind of worried it might be blocked, so. But I'll make sure I have my code over here on the left to finish off. And before I'm done, I'll make sure I scroll through all of my code slowly so that way people looking at the recording can pause it and um, get what they need to get.
Okay, so the first thing I'm doing is just gonna insert a picture. And I insert a picture like this. So after my headline two, I'm gonna create an IMG tag, an image tag. There we go. Now the image tag has to have some attributes to work. Kind of like the anchor tag has to have some attributes, the image tag has to have attributes. SRC is gonna be the source of my image. There we go. So this is the syntax for inserting an image with HTML. I'll insert an image with CSS too, but we're doing the HTML version first. Okay, so I write out my image tag. That's angle bracket, IMG space, SRC for source, equals quotation, and then I have the name of an image, which I don't have yet. I have to go get an image in a second. I have the name of an image, closing quotes, space, alt, A-L-T, equals quotation, and then just alternate text. I'm gonna correct that in a little bit. And then closing quote. Now for this to work, of course, I need an image. And especially, I need an image stored in my working folder. Okay, remember at the beginning of class I said, all my files need to be grouped together in this one working folder. So I need to get an image into there. So what I'm gonna do is jump out to the web and I'm gonna do a search for an image. And since I said this is gonna be my favorite animal, I need to search for the animal that's new over at the uh, National Zoo. New baby animal at National Zoo, Washington, D.C. What do I get? Image search. Hey, it's a baby panda. So, all right. I'm gonna click on this one. There we go, so there's a little baby panda image. I know this is scrunched up over here on the right. So I'm using Google Images, I'm just displaying some images. I'm gonna right click on one particular picture and I'm gonna choose Save Image As. Now I'm gonna save this image into a particular location. Not this location, you're gonna see this in a little bit, this is uh, for the assignment that I did. Um, that you're going to do soon. I'm going to go to my 178 participation 5 and I'm going to save the image here. Now this image has a pretty large file name and I'm going to correct the file name but this is important. When you save an image off the web don't change the file extension. My image is a JPG. I'm just going to change it to panda. It's still a .jpg though and I'm going to save it right there. So if I look at my folder, I have my web page file, and now I have my panda.jpg. Okay. I'm going to do that again, though, to make sure everyone's got it. So I'm going to do an image search. This time I'm going to search for um, river otter. Okay, so I see a picture of a river otter that I want. Again, just doing a Google image search. I'm gonna right click, save image as, and I'm saving this picture to the same location as my web page file. Now, instead of the file name it gives me, I'm gonna change it to a more easy to remember file, but I'm not changing the extension. Okay, so now within my folder, I've got my web page file and I've got two image files, otter.jpg and panda.jpg. Let 
which means on the code for my page, I can put in panda.jpg as the file name for the source attribute. And it means I can put in uh, baby panda as the alternate text. Would that also work if it was a PNG file? It absolutely would work if it's a PNG. Of course, the only thing different is instead of JPG, you've got, if I could type it, PNG. Yeah, so when it comes to photos on the web, JPG is the most popular. PNG is probably second. However, JPG gets you a better file size, but it's perfectly reasonable that a PNG image would show up. Now, if it was a kind of an animated looking photo, like a cartoon looking photo, logo, line art, then PNG is more popular. But for photos, JPG, you're gonna see more. You might see a GIF, a GIF, but um, that's pretty rare for photos. Okay, so I've changed my code. So I'm gonna control S to save. I'm gonna head over to my web page. Now when I refresh, I should see, I should see a picture of a panda. It's tough to say. There it is. That's one panda. Now my picture is pretty large, so I'm going to fix it up here. In addition to this other content, I'm going to put width equals 400. Now, even people that have taken web development with me before probably have not seen me do this, okay? This is a pretty old fashioned way to size an image. So I don't typically show it, but it's very fast, it's easy and it works. And for today, that's gonna be great. So by putting this in my image tag, it's gonna make sure that my image width is only 400 pixels. And that's how you write it. Just put in the number. You don't have to put, don't put the PX or anything like that. So now if I save that and I refresh my web page, my image is a lot smaller. Uh, no, good question, Ashley. So when she saves her image, the extension is not showing up by default. Don't type it in because what you'll probably do is have two extensions. So don't type it in. However, when you look at your files that you've saved, lay eyes on what kind of extension it is, what kind of file it is. Probably JPG, but it could be a ping. Okay, so that's how I do an image tag. Now you notice there's no closing image tag. That's okay. There's a couple of tags that don't have a closing counterpart. Hmm. So there's a couple, uh, couple issues that have come up. Larry, yours is gonna be really easy to fix, okay? Because I know exactly what happened. So on Larry's, Clicking on his picture is taking him to the W3 Schools website. So Larry, what I want you to look at is go up to where you did that hyperlink and make sure you have a closing anchor tag after the letters HTML. And a closing anchor tag has that slash in it. Now, Ashley, your issue, images are always a little bit tricky, but there's several things that usually come up with images. Um, 
file name is one of the big things and then saving location is the other one. So what I definitely want you to do is when you're looking at the folder where everything is saved, make sure you can see that your image is truly in the same area as your web page, the same folder. Once you confirm the file is in that same folder, then go ahead and lay eyes on that file name and make sure you're getting the file name exactly. Cool, Josh, no worries. Hmm. All right. So Larry's getting a different issue. And, uh, and, and Ashley, after you confirm that file name, then you have to make sure it's spelled exactly the same way in your image tag. Because if there's a typo in the image tag, anywhere in that image tag, not just the file name, it could be somewhere the IMG could be misspelled, the SRC could be misspelled, any, any typo in that area is going to keep that image from working. So you need to make sure all of the syntax is correct, not just the file name syntax, but even the IMG and the SRC and all that stuff. And Larry, I think now your issue could somewhere be right up here in this hyper reference. Don't forget there should be quotation marks on that hyper reference. For the anchor tag. Excellent. He reported that he fixed that issue himself, so. Cool. Now I fixed my file name, so let me refresh that. Okay. So that's how we get an image in there. And Ty, your headline too is still a little wacky. Text or photo couple things we would look for. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting anything. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not too, you know, these kinds of things happen because obviously this is the first time we've done this stuff and it's really weird. This is one of the situations where if we were on a face-to-face -face class, I could walk around and look over your shoulder and be able to point to things pretty quickly and easily. So, um, and it's not practical for each of us to share your screen, but I'm willing to bet the problem is easy to solve. If stuff doesn't show up, usually this is where closing tags start to become an issue. Because if you start to leave out closing tags, that can start to impact things. But don't you worry, because after class, if your file isn't looking right, what I'm gonna have you do is maybe email your HTML file to me. And then I'm gonna be hanging out here, and then just, but email it to me, and then I'll email you back your file, and I'm gonna pinpoint things that I want you to look at. Okay. And so then when you look at that feedback and you look at your, um, at the recording, even if you need to, but I'll be able to use my little arrow tool and I'll be able to highlight specific things that I think are causing the problems. Our pages are relatively simple. And so I should be able to look at them pretty quickly and be able to point out things that I think are causing some issues. So I'll probably have several of you just email me your files right after class and then I'll respond, uh, soon, soon after. Okay. So, but that's the technique, the basic technique for getting that image inserted. Now, I think I, I want to do one more thing. Um, I don't think I will make the image into a hyperlink, although it's pretty easy. Yeah, I might as well. If I wanted an image to be a hyperlink in front of the image, I do a hyperlink again with an anchor tag. This time I'm just going to go to COCC, because I've got their web page memorized. So I put an opening anchor tag before the image. And then after the image, 
my closing anchor tag. Notice I'm not using the little target equals underscore blank. I'm just gonna simplify this one. So this particular hyperlink is not gonna open in a new browser tab. So I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna refresh my browser. Now, in theory, when I click on my baby panda, it's gonna take me to the COCC website. I'm pretty optimistic because when I move my, my cursor, my pointer, over the picture, I get the little hand pointer, which means I'm probably a hyperlink. And if I look at the web address in the lower left corner of my browser, I can see that it looks like it's gonna to go to the right website. So when I click on this little panda, I go to the COCC website. When I click the back button on my browser, I go back to my web page. So that's the basics for making an image into a hyperlink. Now, Sam, I don't think I'm gonna address your question on an image with CSS but I promise you it's part of our assignment and I show you how to do it on there. Sounds good. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, we're, we've, we've been banging away at this for almost a couple of hours and um, it just adds just an extra level of complexity. I want us to at least kind of absorb what we've done. You know, we've had successes. Some things aren't working maybe so much, but we're going to get those all fixed up when you email me uh, later. But I think this is a good start to what I wanted us to get into, and that's basic web page publishing. And of course, what I've got here isn't really that different than what Apple has on their website. We've got text, we've got images, and we've got hyperlinks. And that's all that any website has, except Apple has more of it. They have more text, they have more images, and they have more hyperlinks. And yeah, maybe their colors are cooler than mine. Maybe their font looks better. Maybe they sell nicer products. That doesn't matter. We're still, we're making the web pages in the same way that big companies make web pages. Okay. And that's really the takeaway that I want you to have from this one. Now we're gonna be wrapping up here pretty soon, but before we do that, I'm going to do a couple things to make sure we're all clear. I'm gonna turn word wrapping on. Eh, I don't like word wrapping there. I'm gonna turn word wrapping off, and I'm gonna make my font a little smaller. Okay, and basically I wanted to make sure that my, my class recording had places where you could easily pause and go back and check later. So, so here's the top portion of my web page. It's got my HTML tag, head tag, title, and then I've got the styling. This is all within the head section. And you can see the three style rules that I have. Now I'm gonna scroll down. After my closing style tag, I've got a closing head tag. Then I've got an opening body tag. And I've got the start of my web page content. Headline one, headline two, a paragraph. And then I've got an unordered list. Now this unordered list contains multiple list items. And the one thing that you can't really see that well is my one of my list items has a hyperlink in it. So I've got the anchor tag with the hyper reference attribute right there. And off to the right, goes a little bit longer, but that's pretty much it there. Closing anchor tag, that's a key part. long list item. After the unordered list is what I've got last, is I've got a little headline two, and then I've got an image that's displaying as a hyperlink. The only thing left on my page is the closing body tag and the closing HTML tag at the very bottom. 
So that's my entire HTML file. Obviously pause that where you need to so you can see stuff. And the other recap I wanted to show you is the folder, the, the things that I'm working with, I've got my web page file, all lowercase and no spaces, ends with an HTML extension. And then I've got my panda picture. Now I've also got this otter picture, which I haven't used at all. So maybe I'll throw that in at the very end. Actually be easy enough to do. I could copy that, paste, Change this to otter. Keep everything else the same. Oops, can't do that. Baby panda is now river otter. So now I've got these two images. And there's the otter showing up. There we go. On your browser, if you did two images, they probably show up side by side. Don't be put off by that. Okay, so that's my HTML. So what you're doing for class, let me head over to, this is our folder here. Oops, that's the wrong button. Ignore that one. So obviously this class recording is gonna be key for our Participation 5 basic web page. Follow along with the class demonstration, live review the recording. You're gonna make this web page. You're gonna end up with multiple files. You're gonna zip them together. So when you're ready to zip your files, you're just going to go to your participation folder. Oops, that's not it. And where is it? Ah, there it is right there. I can't see. It makes it tiny. So there's my participation page or folder, I mean. Right click, send to compress zipped folder. And that's what you'll end up zipping to me. And in fact, even the students that want to want me to spot check their web page, which I definitely want to do, you could do this as well. You can zip it up and send it to me zipped up, and then I'll get your images and I'll get everything in your folder. So that would be a good way to go. So zip that up, and that's what you're going to submit right there in Blackboard. Okay. And if you need me to help you out with it first, cool, zip it up, send it to me. I'll send it back with some ideas and then you can um, submit that later on. Sometime this week, take the quiz, a lot of multiple choice questions. And I think we addressed most of the questions in class. I just made this quiz the other day, so I'm still pretty fresh in my mind. This is gonna be the tough one this week. You've got an assignment where you're making a web page. However, you're going to make a web page that looks like this one, but better. But there's a video recording of me going through all the steps. It's what we did today, but more of it. It's also some more complicated things. Okay, So it's going to take you longer, but you're going to go through this recording. You're going to pause frequently. You're going to save, and you're going to go step by step. And you're going to get in touch with me if you get lost somewhere. So that's our plan for this week. And by the end of the week, you're going to have a really good feeling about what it takes to make web pages. You may not like it, or you may think it's too complicated, or you may not want to spend any more time doing it, but at least you're going to have a good understanding of what's involved in making web pages, at least the HTML, CSS side of things. So that's our work for this week. I'm going to go ahead and uh, end our class here. However, I'm going to go to my email and I'm going to be expecting emails from at least a few people, I think. Even if you think you're going to fix it up on your own, I'd still like you to send me your web pages and you could zip it up and send it to me just so I can kind of point out a couple things on it. Because I imagine all of the issues are probably pretty small and probably very easily fixed, but because you're new to it, it's not jumping out at you. But I think I can be able to help you out there. Um, so even the Mac users, I'm still kind of curious to see your web pages, especially um, just kind of look to look at the HTML and make sure everything looks good there. Okay. So thanks for hanging out with me. Let me uh, make sure my chat is open to everyone. Thanks all. Um, I'm going to end the class here, but I'm going to be on my email and I'm going to be expecting some emails from several people with their attached web pages or their attached zip files. So thanks, see you later.
All right.